Welcome to another episode of Gates Indie Chronicles. I'm Kevin Abard, your host, and we have a special guest today. And we're going to be talking about a, a, a topic that uh, touches a lot of people in New Hampshire. Many people are very familiar with this particular topic because uh, it, it's life changing. And uh, that has to do with the Alzheimer's uh, situation, which many of us uh, are faced with from time to time. And uh, because uh, I did put in some legislation uh, regarding Alzheimer's, I had asked uh, Melissa Grenier to come on the show. Uh, she's with the New Hampshire Alzheimer's Association. And she's gonna talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what, we're, what we could be facing and what uh, they do here in New Hampshire. So with that, Melissa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Senator, yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah, so you're with the Alzheimer's Association. Correct, yeah. yes, we have an office in Bedford. We mm -hmm. serve the whole state of New Hampshire and our Bedford office is actually part of the Massachusetts, New Hampshire chapter of the Alzheimer's. So we're a two state chapter, but I'm just responsible for uh, what we do programmatically in New Hampshire. So um, I had been asked by, by the association actually to uh, uh, put in some legislation because there's a, a, a situation where um, we might be getting uh, an influx of, 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 because New Hampshire is aging, there's going to be an increase uh, over the next 5, 10, uh, 20 years, uh, up to 20% increase. Uh, in, yeah, in, roughly. In, yeah, there's going to be a really significant increase in the number of people over the age of 65, and therefore uh, uh, it will significantly increase the number of people that we also have that are living with Alzheimer's disease in the Granite State. Right. And well, again, we're, we're aging. So a, a typical scenario with, with somebody who is uh, introduced to, when this comes into their life, they have a loved one that, that, that comes down with this. What are some of the things that they, have, they, they end up going through? Well, I think at the beginning, there's a ton of uncertainty mm -hmm. about what is this disease process? Is it, is it dementia or is it something else? If it is dementia, what type of dementia specifically? There's more than one, obviously. There's more than one, exactly. Okay. Alzheimer's disease accounts by far for the vast majority of of people who get diagnosed with a dementia. So mm -hmm. over 60 to 80% of people who get diagnosed with some type of dementia, it ends up being Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of uncertainty. uncertainty. There's a lot of fear and stigma that surrounds this disease process and a lot of embarrassment, I think, as well, when someone starts to lose their cognitive abilities, their memory and concentration and communication. Uh, I, I think that's a real struggle for, for anybody. When I put myself, I'm right. sure, as, as you do, with supporting our legislation, when we think about people living with the disease and their caregivers, there's a lot that goes into it emotionally, mentally, financially, certainly. Sure, yeah. I, I know that when I go up to testify, if I have a, uh, a, a brain cramp, we'll call it, <laughs> uh, just that alone, right, right there, everybody's staring at you, you're looking to make a comment, you forgot where you're going with it, maybe. Uh, it, it doesn't come to, back to you. And there's a certain degree of panic that comes in. Absolutely. And uh, and like you said, embarrassment. So multiply that by you know a, a progressive uh, amount on a daily basis. Uh, that could make a lot of fear. Uh, so where does your association get involved? How do, what do you do? So, the Alzheimer's Association can can get involved um, with someone uh, in a lot of different ways, running the gamut from someone reaching out to us and needing something as simple as a local support group list mm -hmm. or a list of adult day health programs in their area of where they live in New Hampshire, all the way to someone who's really struggling with making the decision to place mom or dad, say, from their home into assisted living mm -hmm. or a nursing home. Um, and even beyond that, we have folks that come to us with significant crises. Sometimes the crises um, rise to the level of us needing to report it to the Bureau of Elderly and Adult Services or really get a lot more, um, help this family get a lot more supports in place sort of quickly as best as we can. So the best way to do that is to reach out to our toll-free 1-800 number, mm -hmm. um, our our 1-800-24-7 um, helpline, excuse me, is available just like it sounds, nights, weekends, and holidays. There's a human being on the other end, and it doesn't cost anything. So, you know, we know that there's not a lot in this world that's free anymore, and Alzheimer's disease is the most expensive disease process in the U.S. right now. Right. So whatever we can do to support a person 
um, and plan for the plan for the future um, and, you know, pass legislation locally or federally to support those efforts. You know, we're going to do our best to do all of that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I did bring in uh, my bill. Uh, uh, it doesn't have a bill number yet, but um, <laughs> basically uh, it's directing the Department of Health and Human Services to develop a public awareness campaign on brain health. Alzheimer's disease is related to dementia and uh, making an appropriation thereof. And it has an appropriation of, I think, about $500,000 uh, uh, for the department to uh, help it, uh, the public be aware. Uh, some people are caught off guard on this. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. So what are some of the, the signs that some people could, you know, I'm going to be 60 next week. <laughs> All right. And people start to worry. Yeah. but We start to worry. It can actually start earlier than that, from what I understand. Oh, it absolutely can. We call that young onset Alzheimer's disease, right. and that can occur under the age of 65. The youngest person I have worked with in my career was 41 years old. Right. Um, and we are, with the advances in technology and being able to diagnose people earlier and more accurately, I think that's why... Um, we're, we tend to see, we're seeing more cases of people in their 50s, late 40s. And I think that's just because people are being diagnosed more accurately and earlier than before. And speaking of which, isn't there some Hollywood actor? He, uh, I think it's Thor. Um, I, or uh, he played some famous, he's a famous actor and he's got a series because he was, he was told that he has a, a certain genetic uh, proclivity towards Alzheimer's. And so he's doing everything he can to live out his life sure. at his fullest, do as much as he can with his body as far as making it as strong as possible to sure. fight what, what he can. But uh, apparently he was diagnosed with, uh, with early onset. Um, it, it wouldn't surprise me. I'm not sure exactly who you're talking about, but we've seen plenty of people in the media, mm -hmm. musicians, um, actors, um, famous people. I mean, this disease is not discriminating. There right. are astrophysicists who come down with Alzheimer's right. and other types of dementia. There are people who, um, you know, work in our municipalities. I mean, it just, Anywhere. no, sure. yeah, no it's, one's immune to it. Doesn't Absolutely. discriminate against anybody. Correct. So uh, what are some of the early signs of what people look for? Yeah. Some of the early signs are things like having an issue with, or starting to have some, some issues with short-term memory. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I mean by that is, say, what you had for breakfast, right, uh, versus uh, the fact that most people with Alzheimer's specifically maintain their, their long-term memories. And a long-term memory would be maybe what your, uh, pet, your pet's name was when you were growing up in elementary school, right? right. But um, so short-term memory loss is typically very much impacted with Alzheimer's disease, specifically as a dementia. We also see trouble with focusing and concentrating on tasks and completing familiar tasks. Mm -hmm. So say a person was a home, a woman was a homemaker and she really built her life around taking care of the home and the kids and all of that. And all of a sudden she started having trouble, um, you know, completing the laundry or cooking like she used to um, and operating the stove properly. So what we think of as um, peculiar sometimes later on years later you might think oh wow there were some interesting things that was happening in the family and I just didn't put two and two together until it sort of becomes more of a pattern mm -hmm. uh, folks also tend to have trouble with communication so finding the words that they want to use participating in kind of that back and forth um, pattern of conversation that we have in western culture um, uh, using words illogically um, so making their, yeah, making their needs known, but also understanding what other people are saying to them. Mm -hmm. uh, we also see withdrawal from work or activities that a person used to love to do. We see changes in mood and personality. We see changes and deficits with judgment. So, you know, as we get older, we also we certainly become more susceptible to say things like financial fraud and scams. Well, when we talk about someone or a population, right, who an increasing population that has dementia, that puts them at an even higher risk, risk for self-neglect or scams and fraud and exploitation. Oh, and that happens. My in-laws, uh, they got a call uh, twice now, mm -hmm. two separate times. Hey, uh, your granddaughter needs some money because she's in jail. What? And they knew the granddaughter's name, uh, but it, it was a fraud. Yeah. And they target senior, senior age population, and that information's out there. You know, yeah. So, uh, 
a little bit about the support groups that, that you had mentioned sure. early. Uh, so what type of early uh, intervention or, or early support groups do you, do you recommend? Where do you find them? Uh, how do you, uh, you know, how do you get the people uh, to start talking about it? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think an awareness campaign is going to be really crucial mm -hmm. uh, because I can't tell you how the, uh, no matter how hard we work, right? You, the Department of Health and Human Services and our work and plenty of other agencies, plenty of people are not aware of Alzheimer's disease and the impact or the uh, the impact that it has on their families or on the community. They're not sure what to look out for. Um, and therefore, they, if they don't know those things, they don't know to get a diagnosis and then to get supports. But once a person has a diagnosis or their loved one has a diagnosis, um, support groups are a great way for I call it peer-to-peer -peer support. So if I'm a caregiver, I can go and talk to people who are also caregivers, right. who understand sort of implicitly what I'm dealing with. But also we have support groups in person and virtually for people who are living in the early stage of the disease, because it's really important that they feel supported and have that quote unquote peer support right. as well. They're, they're going through similar, but not, um, exactly the same thing as say their care partners. So um, in order to get a, a list, um, folks can visit our website, which should be scrolled across the screen today. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can also call that toll free um, uh, helpline that we have. And that's 1-800-272-3900. Um, and again, they, they people can call that number and not even know what they need. Sometimes people call and they're just really stressed out and they need emotional support. And then as we talk to them, my colleagues and I, we kind of tease out, well, it sounds like safety is an issue. There's been a lot of right. falls or sounds like um, you're concerned about how to pay for care or right. all manner of things. And when, we, when you've met one person with Alzheimer's, you've met one person with Alzheimer's. So at the Alzheimer's Association, we really tailor whatever our support and our resources are for that person or that family, because it's it's very unique from family to family. Right, and uh, is, have you seen an uptick in, 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 in cases this, in the last few years or? Well, I would say that um, for me, there's always been a constant. <laughs> okay. I think when, when I'm public facing, there's just a steady stream Right. That, you know, and when but when we really analyze the numbers and we get updates to our statistics every year, uh, actually next month or the month after, we'll have a new sort of topic sheet and a new analysis of, of the impact of Alzheimer's in in each state in New Hampshire. Right. And so that's the time of year when I get my sort of updated numbers about the sort of statewide impact. I'm working with family to family or groups, uh, but I'm not necessarily, you know, counting the, the vast number of people in New Hampshire that have the disease. And so it's, it's, all, it's still startling to me, right. you know, when I see periodically, when I see those numbers rising every year, every few years, every decade, and so to, so to speak. I think uh, Jess gave me, uh, either Jess or Tom, gave me a, uh, a chart, and I, I think it was 23% increase. Over, yes. But I didn't over, know how, how, over what period of time. I, uh, I believe that that is, um, I want to say 2050. Most of our statistics go out, mm -hmm. you know, 20, 25 years. Which isn't a long time. It, it seems like an incredibly long time, but it's really not. It's not. <laughs> It'll go by in a heartbeat. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, five years in increments now. It's not really a, that's right around the corner. And so 25 years or so, you know, we're looking at a substantial, if, if that's our population, that's, that can be devastating. I mean, the, the, along with the financial costs that go along with that. Nursing homes. Sure. Uh, six months and pretty much... Uh, you're you're empty of all your bank accounts. So, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, a particular bill in HHS yesterday, Health and Human Services in the Senate, and Alzheimer's got up. It, it, it was brought up, sure. and uh, you know, getting people pre-approved for uh, you know reimbursement and all that. Uh, some people, if they're losing some of their faculties, they don't know what to do with their finances, and and that could that could injure their the prospects for, for an application for reimbursement. Oh, absolutely. And that can, uh, somebody mentioned that it can get stalled for up to a year and a half. So what do you do in a year and a half? You, you know, 
if you don't know where everything goes, uh, that's why a will is important, by the way. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. we talk to families about that all the time. And we do have education programs in addition to support groups. Mm -hmm. We offer online and in-person education programs. We offer first responder and law enforcement trainings. And all of these things are, are available for free. Mm -hmm. um, and calling our helpline or visiting our website, there's no copay, there's no referral. Um, so um, we try to make it as easy and accessible as possible for people to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. um, I think the awareness campaign will be really helpful if we can, um, if, if that um, effort can, can sort of seep into primary care physicians' offices. Doctors are, uh, especially PCPs, are often the sort of gateway to someone getting a diagnosis early on. And I can't tell you how many physicians don't know that we exist. And, really? And so they... So huh. what 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 breaks my heart as as a clinician and as someone who's been working in the field for almost two decades is that when when someone comes to me and says, "Oh, my husband's had Alzheimer's for eight years, and we're so happy we found you," and I'm like, "I am too, but I'm I'm a little sad you didn't find us sooner." And so um, it'll be it'll be great to see where these where the awareness can can increase because because again we want. Um, doctors who are diagnosing people with Alzheimer's to, you know, be able to do whatever they can do, but then outside of that, have something else that they can refer them to, if nothing else. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, um, there is a, about a five hundred thousand uh, dollar appropriation for this, and so that's where HHS. So they're going to communicate with the physicians. Yes. How about with the public in general? Uh, is that part of it, or is oh, it, absolutely. Is it the... Oh no, absolutely. I think the public <clears throat> um, at large um, would definitely benefit uh, from uh, more information about the warning signs of Alzheimer's, but even just. Um, the fact that a person's risk goes up as they age right. pretty significantly, that they're, that Alzheimer's disease is a primary player in terms of, uh, you know, um, being the most diagnosed type of dementia, but that there are other types of dementia that exist. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, um, that it's really critical that we emphasize, um, you reference this in terms of the finances and the importance of a will, you know, we need to emphasize how critical it is that people pay attention to their cognitive health in a similar way, but not exactly the same as mental health. I mean, how tough is it in this country to to talk about mental health? I think in a similar fashion, it's right. really hard for people to acknowledge and talk about cognitive deficits, but I tell people to run, not walk to their doctor if they're concerned that there's anything cognitively going on. Mm -hmm. um, we just added uh, telehealth uh, to uh, mental health just so that- uh, Which just, is amazing. Uh, yeah, and we, I think it was my bill, actually. <laughs> But uh, it was, um, you know, we, we just want to extend it. Not, it, it, It's not, you know, over-encompassed. It's a little baby step, just sure. so. But uh, mental health is, uh, it, 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 we're always hearing, you know, it, you can't go up to the Capitol and not hear something about mental health, mental health, of mental course. health, and, uh, and on and on. Uh, you know, you were talking about short-term and long-term uh, memory, and it brought to mind a movie that I watched a, a few years back uh, um, with Tracy was... Um, the notebook. Sure. And uh, she would come in and out, but uh, there's something that she could just walk up to a piano and play something like Mozart or Moon River Absolutely. or some, some weird thing. But uh, it, it's interesting how, how devastating it can be. And then uh, for a minute, you, you, you have that person. It's a beautiful story, actually. It is. It's, yeah. it's gut-wrenching, too. But uh, uh, it, did you see it? I did. I have seen that. And is that a reality? I mean, it's Hollywood, but I mean, is were they right on target? You think? I think they. I think they were. Mm -hmm. I think there's. Um, it, it was definitely realistic, and when you realize that that's what happens, yeah. you know that that's the disease process sort of playing out. Um, nice love story. Oh, it's a beautiful love story, yeah. and uh, uh, you know, a testament to the love and the care and the mm -hmm. sensitivity that so many family members and caregivers have. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it's, I do think it's realistic and um, there are moments of clarity and moments of joy. And then there's plenty of moments of sort of grief and sadness about the losses. Yeah. Uh, somebody, uh, there was a story of uh, an individual. She had to put her husband in the, uh, uh, a nursing home uh, because of the disease. And he struck up a relationship with another woman in, in the, yeah. I don't know who told it, maybe, <laughs> but 
he thought this other woman was his, his wife. Sure. And when his wife came to visit, he would introduce her to his wife. So the pain that that's got to, yes. that's got to be extremely painful. And it, it is, it's, it's painful for the caregivers, it's painful uh, for the individual. And so uh, any way that you can comfort somebody through this process, uh, and hopefully there, there's some type of miracle drug that can come out and, and alleviate that. Um, I'm quitting sugar. <laughs> I'm trying good luck. to. Yeah, yeah right. good luck, right? <laughs> right. I, it's even in the mayonnaise, for crying out loud. <laughs> you know, but uh, not that that's the cause, but, uh, you know, I'm just trying to take care of your health. Sure. You know, uh, and uh, so you mentioned the, the, the phone number a couple of times. So could you do that one more time? Yeah, our 24 7 helpline is 1 800 272 3900. And again, it's literally 24 hours a day. There will be someone to pick up the phone mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the night. And when I talk to physicians or healthcare providers, uh, really anybody I say who's in the field, right? Helping people with, living with memory loss. I'll say, this isn't to replace all the good work you're doing. This is so that we can help people outside of whatever you're able to provide because right. primary care offices close at five o'clock. Sure. And if someone, if someone you know, needs just a conversation, right, to help them maybe prioritize what they need to do with their loved one or just give them some emotional support and help them relieve some anxiety. You know, they can't call their doctor for that, right? Um, but they can call us. Right. And so if emergency services, I mean, supposing something's, uh, in, do you do with that as well? I mean, if somebody's got a crisis, um, an immediate crisis? Well, it depends on what it is. So I'll give you an example. Sometimes people call us when their loved one has wandered. Ah. And uh, that's happened before. And so I usually tell people or I'll ask them, you know, have you called your local police department yet? And if they say, no, I called you first because I thought of you first. I said, well, thank you so much. But okay, like, it. let me get your contact information. You need to get off the phone with me and call law enforcement. And then why don't I call you in an hour and check in with you and see how you're doing so mm -hmm. I can provide or we can provide support to the family member sort of during that incident. But we, can, we also like to follow up with that family after the fact to help prevent, in this case, wandering right. from potentially happening again in the future. Yeah, there's two things. Uh, years ago, uh, I know there was a company up in the, uh, I think it was in Pentecook or in Concord, it was called Secure Care. Hmm. And they used to make the wristbands for individuals so that if they were to wander sure. out, it would automatically lock the door. Yep. Uh, and if, I think Apple also has these things, which are their trackers, mm -hmm. and you can sew them into the clothes and like stuff like that. Like tiles or, you know, Yeah, something. They're, they're like a tile or something yeah. like that. And they, they pe people put that on their um, uh, uh, cell phone. Sure. And... Uh, uh, maybe you can sew that into the clothes or something like that. But yeah. so, but because people do get lost. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 not it's not uncommon. It's very very common. So people should expect that if their loved one has memory loss, six out of ten people with any form of memory loss will wander. Mm -hmm. So if someone hasn't wandered yet, that's a blessing. But the likelihood of them wandering is really high. So um, developing a strategy for whether it's a GPS related sort of tracking device, whether it's something else. Um, you know, thinking about that early um, is can be life saving. Well, Melissa, I appreciate you coming on the show. I got about a minute left, so we've already talked about the uh, how to get in contact with you, and yeah. it is a, uh, a wonderful service that you're doing. And, and thank you for helping with the legislation and putting yeah, it out thank there. You. And I hope we can get this passed. I think everybody can agree on on something like this, and uh, we can uh, be of service somewhere from the state level. You know, so appreciate you coming. Thank you so All much. Right. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for watching Gate City Chronicles. And, uh, you know, if you like the show, if you want to come on the show, please, please, by uh, all means, come on the show. And if you're watching it on YouTube, please hit subscribe. That helps us with our algorithms and uh, it gets uh, the message out there. So um, until next week, thanks for watching Gate City Chronicles.